So the album is called Everything's Waiting for You. It's uh, the follow up to uh, your 2019 album Collide. Uh, my feeling is quite a bit has happened between those two events. Uh, you went on tour. You had, all, I mean, all sorts of stuff. Is what? How have you changed as an artist in in between that time? I think that's a great question. I think personally, um, I feel like I've got more confident um, and just a, maybe slightly a bit more ambitious because of the shows that we were playing. So, like for example, when we played Glastonbury, we right. had like a sold out tent, and everyone was singing along, <laughs> and it kind of, I suppose, it kind of like like set up a spark in me to maybe think oh we can play some you know some bigger rooms we can you know the sounds the, the sonic palette could get bigger and um yeah i just say a bit more confident really um i don't think i've changed too much as a person you know and i, I certainly love the same music as i loved on the first record and i think if you're a fan of my music you'll like this new album but i think it's just you know i think every band artist needs to expand on each record i'm hopefully doing that right 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 well you, you mentioned bigger rooms i saw a quote from you saying that when you were making the record you wanted to record uh, make a record that required bigger rooms so is yeah that, is that talking about the studio itself no not really we, we you know obviously i was blessed to record the album um in abbey road and like mm -hmm. rap studios but right it's just i think it's just you know, I, I originally started off when I, my first release um, that we ever did on the first record was like very, very folky, yeah. almost kind of like, um, you know, like Lumineers, Simon and Garfunkel, that kind of vibe. Yeah. And I feel like I just, yeah, I feel like you, you I don't want to make the same record twice, but I also, you know, want to stay faithful to what I do. So there is obviously a bit of that in there, but yeah. I think I'm naturally, I love like, you know, like guitar music as well. So I think there's just a bit more of that in there as well. Okay. So so when you went to, with that in mind, how did you approach making this record? Did did you think about expanding your musical palette, so to speak, a, a bit? And, and how did you do that? Yeah, I think um, the songs naturally, just like our bigger songs, like Everything's Waiting For You, for example. Right. It, it's, it's just such a like um you know not a, like a huge chorus but it's you know it, it, it's not a folk song it's not it's not right. from that world it's it's definitely you know it's could sit alongside like a Coldplay or a U2 song or a Keen song right. you know it's more of that ilk everything's waiting for you that's just naturally what was coming out i wasn't it wasn't like a premeditated thing and you know i just wrote it on an acoustic guitar but it's just like it's a bit more direct maybe right yeah well you mentioned uh, the title track which is the first track and the following one let let the river run is for want of a better word something of a banger <laughs> oh thanks man that's, uh, that's that's very kind like um yeah no i love that song it's you know it's inspired by like more i suppose like people like the cure smiths Right. A lot of great English bands, you know. And then, and, and that's followed in, by a song called "Dive," which I believe you had a guy named Chris Bond producing a, that one with you. So tell me what he brought to the table. Blue skies, kind heart, leading me out the dark. Oh Lord, I was lost. Cold light, new. Sending me up this town, this night. Well, he, he produced my first album. He uh -huh. did also do five songs of this second album. And he he's just like, he's just a fantastic 
not only is he a fantastic guy, but he he's just a, a, a like a genius with most instruments. Like he plays drums, he plays guitar, bass, synths, all of this kind of stuff. But he's also got a great ear for like textures. And I think with dive, there's it's like he, it bring it takes you into this kind of other world kind of thing. Yep. Um, which I think he does so brilliantly. Um, and it's one of my favorite songs on the record, actually. Dive. Um, I think it's got like this haunting kind of wintry feel. Right. All right. So um, I, I also saw a quote where you say that you're probably one of the few people who's made two albums in quarantine and, and probably in isolation. So I, yeah. I understand what the first one you, you went through some stuff there. But tell me about making this one and what that was like the environment. Well, I just you know, it's a weird one because I my experience of making albums is just like it's just difficult. Like it's just become <laughs> like a like it's become like a almost like a. I don't know, like I'm going through some weird divorce or something, right. you know, like um, where it's just, it's just painful. Um, but it hopefully doesn't reflect that in the music, but it's, it's just, you know, this one, the first one was really painful, like, but then also there was a lot of joy in there because when I did get back into that studio, I felt like I was like on fire, like in the sense of like, you know, I was ready to take on the world and I just, you know, and it's just kind of a similar one with the second one, you know, I was locked in my, in, Obviously, everyone else was locked in indoors for like five months or whatever in England. Yeah. And um, my first experience of kind of going out was being let into a studio. And right. it was just, again, like the best feeling of being unleashed and just making music with your friends. And so how many people, what kind of vibe was it like once you walked into that studio? Did you have a lot of people bustling around? Was it kind of quiet and intimate? What? It was, it was more restricted than normal. So in Abbey Road, we, you know, we'd have less people in at one time, right? It would be a bit more sporadic. And when people were coming in, there was masks involved. <laughs> which is obviously, you know, yeah. pretty weird when your gu guitarist is doing a solo and he's wearing a mask. Um, <laughs> So it, that it is just, weird. You know, it, it is weird. It's, it's, you know, it's just, it was strange, but music, it, it felt a bit like an escapism as well. You know, I felt like when we were making the record, it was like, kind of like last summer, around about August, we did the bulk of it. Right. And um, it was just, you know, it was a very strange time to be a, 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 like a human being, wasn't it, really? <laughs> um, so music provided me with escapism. And the same thing happened on the first album. You know, when I was in the hospital for two months with Crohn's disease, I was writing, I had a room for a couple of weeks on my own and I was writing, you know, I had my guitar writing songs. It's escapism for me. It always, always has been. Right. Okay. So yeah, there's a track called Him For Her with uh, yeah. a person named Lydia Close, I believe was featured on that one. So tell me, tell me how that one came together. Never be cruel, never out of line I wanna fall so deep so I don't look back Be good to you and keep the path That was actually, this, got, this is very, very COVID related. Uh, it was right. written over Zoom. Over Zoom? Which, yeah, which, you know, obviously it's great to speak to, you know, with Zoom and all this kind of stuff, but... I really, you know, I, I never thought I'd write a song over Zoom. Um, but yeah, yeah, that song came out of it and it was really very, very quick and painless. And it was, it was a, yeah, I'm very blessed to have someone like Lydia's vocals in, in you know, in my kind of canon, really. Right. Um, because she's such a, like, a beautiful vocalist. And I can, you know, when you're writing a song with someone like that, you can kind of just direct her and she can sing anything, which right. is, is, is really free, freeing. Um, so uh, how how did, did was there certain technical things you had to navigate with writing with Zoom or did it just no? Kind of... I just went up there was just an acoustic guitar in similar to this bedroom kind of thing, right? Um, and then I I had initial idea, I had a verse, and I had like a kind of thing, and we kind of just bounced off each other because we know each other so well. We've been singing together for like the last five years, but it was actually the first song we've ever written together. Uh huh. Um, it felt very natural, you know, it's just like friends, you know, I'm sure you, you know, you call up your friend and it's just like, it's like nothing's weird because you know them so well. Right. Well, that helps. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, so it's, you know, really, I'm really proud of that one. I, I produced it as well at Abbey Road, and it was kind of just a lot of fun because it's, you know, it's sonically, it's quite. Um, there's lots of different things going on there. Right, right, right. And, and another person I believe who has uh, helped out on the record is Ollie Knights from uh, Turin Breaks. What what is he doing, and what's your relationship with him like? What, why are you working with him? Ollie and Ollie and the rest, uh, Gail from Turin Breaks, they're kind of like my secret band members in the sense of we we've probably written probably about 100 songs together right which is quite crazy really and that um, is insane you yes. know normally um and some for my stuff some for theirs and it's just it's just been you know they they kind of feel like just friends to be honest and um ollie again he's just he's just got this amazing voice again you know i, I if i can the way I, I treat my music is like if I surround myself with as many good people as possible, eventually I'll, I'll sound good. <laughs> you <laughs> well, know, like that's, it's, that's one way to look at it's it. Like, it's like that kind of thing, really. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really blessed to know people like Ollie and Lydia and Gail and stuff. So, yeah, very, very cool. Very good. Now, my understanding is you're big in Brazil. Apparently so, yeah. Apparently so. so. I assume you've been there to play. Have you? Yeah, yeah, we have. And it was, it was honestly, it was wild. Like, I've never played, uh, like, I played like a mall. Right. Which is quite American, right? That's quite an American thing to do. And I, I did like signing and things like that, which is right. just crazy. Right. So, um, yeah. So what was, I mean, being big in Brazil, I mean, they have their own kind of culture and certainly their own kind yeah. of music. So has that kind of entered into your mindset now? Um, I would say not really, but the one thing I would say is um, I love the way that they just um, like ex like um, what's the best way to say this, Molly? Um, they just channel like good vibes, right? And like uh, when you're in London, like a lot of people are quite like you go on a tube and they're quite downtrodden and like you know they look kind of miserable. Right. When you go around, you know, and you see, you go and play like places like Sao Paulo or Rio and you're playing and you see people in the crowd, they literally look like they're having the best time of their lives. Really? And it's yeah. just, and it, that is quite amazing. I think that is, it's, it, it's quite, um, you know, um, it, it makes you feel like happier as a person and right. it's, it's infectious as well. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I've spent some time in New York City, and the big thing about tra traveling around there is never make eye contact with anybody, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's it, yeah. And, it, and, and you know, it's. It, I feel like London, you know, the, if, you know, obviously there's a big, you know, there, there's obviously poverty and all this stuff, but there's a lot of very privileged people. And sure. I think sometimes we don't realize, I'm, I'm one of them, you know, I'm sure. a very privileged person, like, but I don't, I don't think people realize how lucky they are. Right. In, in a lot of ways. And I think it's just, you know, you go to Brazil and there's not, you know, sometimes they're very poor places and things like that. And people just, you know, ex, you know, they just channel this kind of like, I don't know what it is. If I could bottle it, it'd be amazing. <laughs> very good. So the album but is out on an incredible, sorry, go ahead. Incredible place. Yeah. So the album's out yeah, on Friday, but I place. assume you've gotten some reactions, some reviews, some you've played it for people. Um, is that a, what have those reactions been and, and is that important to you to to see how the reviews come in and how the, fans react i think the biggest reaction for me was when we released the first single right because um i wrote it all on my own i co-produced it it was it was kind of like i felt like i was kind of taking a bit more of a dive like if you look at like say for example like the average top 40 or or any radio players how many of them are writing their own songs? Right. You know, it's quite it's usually like twelve not many people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, you know, and it's it's. I feel like it was kind of like I was really like pleased that the label and stuff and people, you know, my radio plugger and people got behind it and were like, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, and cool. it and then we had um, a lot of radio success in the UK. We were on like Radio Two, which is you know like the kind of the biggest radio station you can get or, sure. as a B listed record, which is really i was really proud of that and um ever since then it's kind of just been you know pretty crazy it's been 
even right. during like you know a lot of it we were in a lockdown but it was still yeah. like the music was just like resonating with people which is i couldn't have asked for more support really yeah. well it's interesting because with that kind of success has its own uh list of possible downsides as well you could suddenly there's this pressure to exceed that success and that your record label could go, oh, why don't you go up to talk to Max Martin in Sweden or something and, you know, write, write yeah, yeah, yeah. okay things. So was there any of that kind of feeling com- coming from anywhere? No, but you know what? I um, I didn't give them a choice because I actually, <laughs> I've, I've written my, I've written and recorded my third album already. There you go. That's a way to do it. <laughs> so uh, like, I've, I've, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm handing it in like in like two weeks time. So, right. Um, I just because obviously you know I, I was used to gigging like a hundred gigs in one year, yeah, and um, I haven't been doing that. So I I got busy writing and I had a lot to write about and yeah. So I I I, I you know I think they the label and everyone's just I'm not I don't think I'm ever going to be like an Ed Sheeran kind of type kind of person. So I think it's just like <laughs> I th- I feel like it's stepping stones building and building and building, which right. is exciting to me. So if if it was left solely up to you, you, would you put this third album out like really close to this one, or would you wait a while? I would like to wait at least like I'd like to get a single out maybe April. Is that right. cool? that's quite soon, isn't it? That's not bad. Yeah. Well, time flies these yeah. days. Yeah. Too. <laughs> exactly. You know, and I, you know, I, I grew up in the '90s. So like, if you look at Oasis, they did three records in from '94 to '97. Yep. And you look at the Beatles. And that was I think, their best stuff too. <laughs> yeah, and you look at like the Beatles. What eight years? Yeah, and they got all that music. It's like insane. So, and I think with the way streaming is these days, like it's very much like it's one thing after the other. It's quick, quick, quick. You know, grab right. your attention. So it's like the days of like maybe me making an album and doing another one five years later. It's just I just don't think it's like yeah. unless you know unless you know it's needed for the music. It should be all about the music, really. And do you but see yourself, like it's in a good flow. Do you see yourself another big worldwide tour in, in the works? Yeah, I think as soon as it's safe and all right. of that stuff. Yeah, I'd love to, you know, um, I'd love to go to Australia and New Zealand. Like, I've really? never been there before. Um, we did America, Brazil, uh, Canada, US, and most of Europe yep. on the last record. So I feel like we've still got some places to, you know, visit really. And did you have to change the way you present yourself or your songs depending on where you were and who, who was listening? Yeah, to you? I think to be honest, I think as long as the songs, you know, when I write a song, it's always on an acoustic guitar anyway. So I think if it can translate on an acoustic, then we're fine. You know, we sometimes play as a five piece band or it's just me and Lydia right. who, um, who go out together and just, you know, do the acoustic thing. Right, right. Yeah. So the album ends with a song called, uh, was it Shine With Me, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So is there a reason why that one kind of wraps it up and, and brings it to I feel point? like it, it, it just, it, it's made to be a closer, you know, the way it kind of just repeats and repeats and it gets, you know, that freeing feeling of Shine With Me with the choir and all that kind of stuff. It just sounds like a closer to me and it's very, it's very chilled out and it's just, it just flows really easily. Alrighty. And I think if it was too early in the album, it just wouldn't make sense to me. But um, again, a lot of fun recording that. We, um, yeah, we had a lot of fun. We had Steve Craddock from Ocean Color Scene and Paul Weller on it. Right, right, yes. And which is great. And um, how'd you Chris rope him did in? Did a great job. <laughs> uh, he only lived down the road, and he, well, he, I don't go. think he had much work on that week. So, <laughs> um, but. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, but I mean, Chris did a great production and it's just, yeah, it's just a really nice song, I think. Thank you for doing this. Very good. Good luck with everything. And hopefully we'll see you down no. in this part of the world sometime soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, we need to get a vinyl to you as well. That uh, would be fantastic. Connection. I'll send them the address. <laughs> yeah. Great. See you, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.